Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to Talks at Google. Um, today, we have Dave Evans here, um, who is going to be talking about uh, designing your life, how to build a well-lived and joyful life. Um, this is a book that he co-wrote with Bill Burnett, uh, and it is based on a course um, that he is teaching now that is that uses design thinking um, to help you uh, address the challenges and goals in your life. So please uh, welcome Dave Evans. Okay, so welcome to Design Your Life. So <clears throat> we're going to spend about an hour together, you know, and let me tell you where we're going to go. Um, so Bill Burnett is the guy that's on a plane going to Korea right now. So he has to run off and talk to Samsung, so he would love to be here, but this is, this is my friend Bill, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm Dave. Um, you know, old Silicon Valley guy, been around, you know, older than any of you by like a way long shot, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I was at Apple in the early, I was the world's first mouse product manager in 1979. Um, yeah, I was old enough to actually have a job then. Um, <clears throat> and then co-founded Electronic Arts, then did management consulting for about 25 years in high tech, mostly enterprise software. Um, you know, and then started doing this teaching thing, which apparently is now my fourth career. All that after completely failing miserably at trying to become an advanced energy technologist 35 years before there was such a thing, which was not in the brochure. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of my background. And we run the Life Design Lab at Stanford, the Life Design Lab at Stanford, uh, which we started in 2007 and has now kind of grown all out of proportion to what we thought it might be. So since we're design guys, you know, we don't do all lecture. That's we're problem-based learning people. Our pedagogy is always interactive. We don't give tests. We give projects. So we will be doing a little bit of work today. Um, <clears throat> and so if everybody either has or is sitting close to a pen, you will be needing to use a pen of that piece of paper that you're holding in your lap. Um, but it's really a mini workshop, a very mini workshop in just an hour. I'll try to even leave some time for Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of like a little taste testing at Costco. You know, um, it's, uh, it's, we're not going to rush you through it. We're just going to give you a little of it uh, so you get a sense of what it's about. So what's the mission? of the Life Design Lab. What are, what are we in business for? Well, the elevator pitch we carefully crafted says that the Life Design Lab's job is to apply the innovation principles of design thinking to the wicked problem of designing your life at and after the university. And if you double click the colored words, you get a white paper. Um, <clears throat> and that's an accurate statement to which most people go, I don't really get that. What does that mean? Um, so even though it's accurate, it's more uh, familial to say something like, well, we're the guys that teach the class to help you figure out what do I want to be when I grow up? <laughs> And we actually don't even like that phrase. It's just a common phrase. We, we don't think there is such a thing as growing up. What do I want to be next as I continue growing up? It's kind of maybe the way we would put that. Um, so that's who we are. And then most people say, oh, wow, now I get it. Can I take the class? I mean, literally, we've been doing this for some time now. And virtually everybody says, can I take the class? I mean, you all showed up, you know, and Maria thought maybe this would be a pretty decent turnout today. And we've got 15 SRO, you know. Um, so how many of you think your life's luck interesting to you? That was not a trick question. Yeah, I mean, like, um, so most people, you know, at Stanford, I'm, I really get to cheat by having one of the most popular electives on campus because, you know, I give people two units in you. You get two units in figuring you out. That's a very, a very popular topic is you. Um, most people think you is really interesting. So that's what we actually do. But what's the problem? What's the problem in addressing this question? Why, why has it become a big deal? Why do people need to take the class? What's the point? I mean, does, everybody has a life. We should know how to do this thing. Well, one of the big problems is what we call dysfunctional beliefs, of which there are many floating around in the cultural meta narrative in which we find ourselves the story about how the world works and, and what's the way it is. And let me give you some examples. So meta narrative number one, since I'm on college campuses a lot, you may remember this kind of stuff. Um, you're talking to one another and somebody says, oh, hey, dude, like, so what are you majoring in? Oh, um, you know, creative writing. The next question is, you all know, what are you going to do with that, you may, uh, you know, other than be unemployed? The, um, and that turns out to be a bogus point of view. I mean, there are career-related majors, some, many of you have had them probably, except 75% of all college graduates are working outside their field of major endeavor within four years of graduation. Now, I guess there are certain demographics that would say that number is different here. How many of you are doing something for a living at Google you studied in college? Probably a whole bunch of you, yeah, but how many are not? Ah, see, more than you think. Um, and, um, and not all those people went to Hack Reactor afterward and got their CS just later. Um, so the point is, that's not a good starting place. That's, that's a dysfunctional belief that your major determines your future. Um, you want to guess how many undergraduate majors we offer at Stanford? 
or Cal or Columbia. The number is about the same, most big places. Like 100 or so? Like 100 or so? No, 68. A mere 68. There are 7 billion people in the world. We do more than 68 different things. And there are many more than 68 job titles at Google. Right? So the question, what are you going to do with that, as opposed to uh, thinking there's some correlation, one-to-one -one correlation between your major and your outcome, is really completely bogus. Another one, <clears throat> our favorite one, what's your passion? OK, who's either said this to somebody or heard it in the last week? <laughs> Keep your hand up if you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. So this is like the popular question. This is the most common definitive starting question on navigating your life in, in the modern culture by our observations. And it turns out, according to the research from Bill Damon and the Center for Adolescence, which studies people up to the age of, right, 27. Um, <clears throat> that's a true story and not because they're broken, um, that uh, about 20, 23% of people in their 20s actually have a clear enough sense of a, of a purposeful direction that they can actually use to guide their lives. You know, so that's maybe one in eight, one in seven. And, and our anecdotal evidence, which is now thousands strong, still anecdotal, but it's thousands and thousands of people, um, overwhelmingly our students and our clients, and we've actually done some work at Google and other places, um, have multiple passions and can't pick or don't know one. So if you start with what's your passion is the right place to begin this whole life navigation discussion, and you know, eight or nine out of 10 people don't even have an answer to that, that's a really bogus way to go about it. It's a lousy question. We mostly think passion is an outcome of a well-lived life, not the starting place. And if you've got one, and it's definitive, and it's clear, and you can do it, and you're trained, and the world wants to let you, and they will pay you for it, that's a bunch of ifs, then go for it. But if not, you're not screwed. So this question makes you feel screwed when you do not deserve to be screwed. Number three, number three, you should know by now. You know, how many of you would say, you know, when you're in your 20s, you somehow got it into your head, whether you know where from, in my case it was Aunt Helen at Thanksgiving when I was 12, told me this. Um, maybe you heard it from Aunt Helen, or maybe you just got it somewhere in the fluoridated water, um, that there is a point in time when if you don't yet know where the city of Oz is that you're pursuing, and you are not yet well along the yellow brick road to get there, you're late. You should know by now, right? How many of you felt there was an age past which if you didn't have your act together, you're behind? And what age was it? 16. 16, okay, it's a <laughs> tough neighborhood, okay, yeah. Well, I just turned 30. So 30. <laughs> so you're really hoping the workshop works. <laughs> you got like, I got 20 minutes, you know. Um, in 2010, when we piloted the very first course at Stanford, the first version that we taught to juniors and seniors, it happened to be the spring quarter. We did our, our need finding in the fall. We did our, our prototyping in the winter. We did our first actual run of the course to a limited number of students in the spring. And I went to one of the uh, administrators. I said, this is so stupid. Nobody's going to take this in the spring. They've already got it all figured out. And he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're going to have plenty of students in the spring. And trust me, every spring, the seniors are really attentive. They're like, uh huh, OK. Can you tell me by four? You know, I mean, because uh, I don't, you know, this life thing, you know, is really pretty compelling. So that's, that's nuts. In fact, we've known for almost a century, developmental psychology is known for almost a century, the age at which people really start becoming their natural selves who can say, yeah, I think this is the me that I want to be investing in at this point, is between 30 and 35. 30, 30. We've known that for a long time. Um, now, life is not a problem to be solved. You know, you're not a big data equation. You're not an algorithm, uh, despite con you know, arguments to the contrary. And um, the reframe of that is life is a creative adventure to be engaged. Therefore, let us build our way forward by designing our life. And to design our life, in fact, the secret sauce in this is design thinking. OK, so what is design thinking, and why does it apply to our lives? OK, I'm so glad you asked that question. So. <laughs> Design thinking is a way of thinking. There's lots of ways to think, and what you want to, it's, they're just toolkits. David Kelly, the founder of IDEO and the, the reigning chairman of the design group, would say, you know, it's just one of the things in your tool belt. You want lots of ways of thinking in, on your belt so you can use it for the right problem. So, you know, if you're doing engineering, you do engineering thinking, you solve your way for it. When you have enough information and you know what you're going for and you can, in fact, solve it, that's technically called a tame problem, by the way. They're tame and wicked problems. And tame problems are well-bounded, understandable. They may be hard. Like cold fusion is a tame problem. It's a really, really hard tame problem. We haven't figured it out yet. But once you figure it out, it will work on Tuesday just as well as it did on Monday. And if we rebuild the Brooklyn Bridge somewhere else, it will stand up. 
right? You know, when you guys build reusable code, it actually runs the second time. It doesn't go, I just don't feel like it today. <laughs> Though on occasion it does do that. Uh, the, um, <laughs> That's apparently something we didn't think about. So that's engineering thinking, which is fat. Any engineers in the room? How many engineers we got in the room? Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and now we have business thinking. And business people optimize their way forward. They're pretty quantitative, too. Most of the better business schools nowadays are quantitative. You know, they'll like to run ROIs and regression analyses and all kinds of things. And they will tell you that they are solving a problem. But in business, you never finish truly getting it right. Your brand is never strong enough. Your market share is never big enough. Your customer loyalty and delight is never deep enough. You know, your clarity is never precise enough. You're never done with that stuff, but you can optimize, you know? And certainly if you're in a place like Google, you can quantify anything, you know? Um, so we will find ways to do that, but you're never done. And it's a way of thinking. And then research thinking, we do lots of research at Stanford, is a very different top-down analytical approach to things, thin slicing like crazy. The real prize is the question at the end nobody can answer. Um, and that's an analytical way for it. The real researchers look at what we do in design, they go, wait a minute, you guys start with the analysis and then you make the hypothesis, of course it, that will always work. You're cheating. We go, dude, you figured it out. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you gotta start with a hypothesis and then prove yourself wrong. That's a drag, that's really not that interesting. Uh, so in design, we build our way forward. We build our way forward because we're helping solve wicked problems. It's actually a technical term developed in the 70s, 70s by some University of uh, California at Berkeley urban planners. You know, inventing a city is kind of a wicked problem. Wicked problems are the ones where the success criteria are ambiguous and change in time. You won't actually know you solve the problem until you do. Once it's solved, you can't reuse the solution ever again because the world changed out from under you. You know, and a bunch of other attributes, kind of like life. So wicked problems are usually inherently human problems. And in human problems, you can't know the answer. So what you're trying to come up with is a way to intersect the future that hasn't occurred yet, interacting with these other people we're, we're working with on whatever it is we're doing, whether it's a piece of software or what I'm going to do with my life. Um, <clears throat> and I have to somehow find a way to get there. And the only way to get there is to build your way forward. You can't analyze your way forward because you don't have enough information. Another terminology that might help here, particularly, would be navigation versus wayfinding. In navigation, which is what your GPS does, I know exactly where I am, I know exactly where I'm going. I know all the data in between, and I can give you the solution. I am now navigating. And you know, we would like to navigate everything because it's more efficient, right? It's faster. But when you don't know exactly where you are, and you only generally have the direction of where you're going, and you sure as heck don't know everything in between, particularly when that thing you're going to is called the future, you know, you haven't got full control over those other seven billion people that mess with it, uh, then you're wayfinding. And wayfinding is a step at a time in this iterative process and more shall be revealed. But I can be better at wayfinding. I can get good at that. So we want to help you develop a conscious competency in life and vocational wayfinding or getting better at becoming the next version of you as you continue growing up. So that's what we're doing. And what is design thinking? Well, it's a process and a mindset. Should I talk faster, by the way? I kind of, you guys can keep up, right? We, okay, because I, I, I like going to Google because I don't have to slow down, as a rule. Um, <laughs> at insurance companies, they go, could you slow down? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing personal, insurance people. They, but the, um, you're, you're great. I mean, um, we we'll just speak a different language. So the five steps are empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So we empathize, we deeply understand the situation. This is the deep dive of the user ethnography, the need finding, what's really going on here. It's all about understanding the user. This is radically not market research. Market research, so do you like this? Okay, that's, I already know what I have in mind. I want to get your reaction to it. I'm jumping to the end. You know, how about, you know, gee, you got a presentation coming up anytime soon? Let me, can I just sit back and watch? I'm observing, I have no bias whatsoever. It's beginner's mind, it's childhood curiosity. You know, the, nobody, no users, as you know, users don't know what they want. You know, apocryphally said about Henry Ford, and there's no evidence he said this, but it sounds just like something he should have. You know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. You know, not a car, nobody thought up a car. Um, so th that's what empathy is about. And then we go to define. We problem find before we problem solve. Coming out of what, what the heck is really going on, having discovered that open-mindedly, not biasedly with the answer already in mind, or not proof texting my answer. We're actually just learning what's going on. So it's a very humble process, a lot of work. Now I know what I'm working on. I can actually define the question I'm actually answering or the problem I'm solving. And then let's have a whole bunch of ideas. I will, in fact, make a better choice and have a better idea if I have many. 
uh, you know, brainstorming, all that stuff, which is not, by the way, just waste post-it notes, take a picture, and then throw it away. That is not brainstorming. Um, it often looks like it. But how to have ideas, and then narrow those ideas down to the ones that were, are worth some investment, and let's go prototype them. Let's try it. Let's actually do it in the real world, not to prove that it's right, but to learn things about that. I'll go into that in more detail. And then test and iterate. So this iteration process here is where designers spend a lot of time. So a big front end, and then after that iteration, oh, there's that thing we totally didn't realize. We made an assumption. Come back here and start over again. So it, goes, it flares and collapses and flares and focuses a number of times. In life design, we make very explicit something designers have always believed, don't always necessarily mention, which is before you do any of this, you have to do acceptance. You cannot solve a problem you are not willing to have. <laughs> You know, we're just having a lunch with a you know, you know, what if I wanted to, to jump into medicine? I mean, you know, because I mean, that's like a really long training time. Okay, well, you know, I don't like it that medical training is long. Thanks for sharing. Uh, that's a lovely thought. It is, okay, get over it. So in acceptance, I can't solve the problem of am I willing to spend a decade of my life training in my 40s? A woman at a seminar we did in, in Greenwich a couple of days ago, 53 years old, really weighing whether or not to go to back to med school and do that whole new thing all over again, you know. Well, you have to start with, that's the way they do it. We don't have the weekend medical degree in this country. Um, so once you get over that problem, now you can actually solve the problem you really have, which is what would it be like to spend 10 years doing that at the age of 53? Um, so that's acceptance, you know, that will allow you to be free in where you really are. Because trust me, if it all comes out cool, it goes through a place that looks just like this. The thing we really lean into because, again, that's a process that ends with an outcome called a, very often a product or user interface or an experience of some kind. But when you're designing a life, it's really about approaching it the way a designer would. I mean, truly think like a designer. And the mindsets we focus on that are these five. Starts with curiosity. You know, what would a designer do? Again, design meaning this innovation methodology. There's an approach that you can facilitate yourself to a more broad set of ideas with a more likely outcome of an innovation result. That's what we mean by design thinking or human-centered design at Stanford. Many of you might think design is craft. You know, it's graphic design, it's, you know, it's industrial design, and those fields are still very vibrant, very important. I want my car to look cool, um, but that's different than what we do. So we're the process guys. How many people actually like, done a de-thinking boot camp? There's a bunch of de-thinking all over Google. Who's been trained in or heard about design thinking, human-centered design? Just a few, okay, great. So this is the news. Um, so curiosity is the starting place. You know, it's like, whoa, what's going on in that? It's like, whoa, what's going on in that? You know, we lean into, everything's interesting if you just knew more about it. Then we want to radically collaborate. We're going to go talk to everybody involved. We know that we don't know. And particularly talk to the people you wouldn't normally have talked to because you're going to get a point of view that's not your own. Then you might be reframing and redescribing that thing in a different kind of way. You know, you're, you know, if you're 28, you're, if, you're, if you just turned 30, you're not late. You're just finally smart enough to have a better answer. Yeah, that's a reframe. Mindfulness of process, it is a process, it takes steps, it is discovery oriented, and you can neither get ahead of nor behind yourself. So you want to keep in mind exactly what is it I'm doing and not be more or less demanding of the current moment than I deserve to be. And the most important one is bias toward action. You know, don't plan, don't think, do, don't plan, prototype. Uh, now we don't mean be willy-nilly or mindless, but we really are saying you can't analyze your way to a solution in a wicked problem. You can only build your way. So you've got to find ways to engage and do stuff, particularly with other people, as soon as you possibly can. So that's, a, that's way more lecture than we're, that's 20 minutes. I did 20 minutes of lecture. That's like twice as long as we normally think people can stand. Um, so it's time to do something. So we're going to do something um, <clears throat> in this hour, just one little mini exercise, and use that piece of paper in front of you. Demonstrate kind of what I'm talking about. We're going to start with your here. Be aware of a certain degree of mindfulness of process and give you a chance to take some action. So, um, for people who will be at home, uh, is there a slide that shows what the paper looks like? Oh, uh, yeah, when we have a slide we can get you to, and there's even a way, yeah. We can, <laughs> so, that's what it looks like. They'll come up on the screen. We'll show you what it looks like and find you a way to get how to da actually download that. It's very easy to draw yourself. So, you've got a thing that looks like this. Okay, and all we're going to do is map your level of energy on your various engagements. So this is actually doing the empathy step right now. First thing to do is just write down a list of the primary things you find yourself doing in any average week. If you've got some things that are monthly only, throw those in too. Um, actually, the example I'm going to give you is actually Bill. If Bill were here, he'd be saying this part. Um, so Bill writes down you know, a bunch of stuff he does. He's the director of the design program. He co-leads this life design lab with me. Still does a little consulting on the side. This is all the stuff he does. And you just make a list. 
And then you go to the graph and you actually try to put a graph on, you put a bar on there for each item and just roughly say, when I'm done doing this, do I gain energy? Do I come out of this thing feeling kind of, you know, energized or depleted? This is a plus or a minus and is it high or is it low? So when Bill takes that list and he makes bars out of them, it looks like that. So, you know, you've got art class, budgeting, office hours, faculty meetings, a bunch of different stuff. Some are high, some are low, some go both ways. Actually, faculty meeting depends on who's talking, you know. Um, <laughs> A little bit, you know, are they talking about the copier is overheating again or talking about, you know, the brave new world of uh, autonomous cars, we, uh, you know, which we do a lot. Um, so it depends on who's talking. So that's what it might look like. So now, um, just take a minute and do those two things yourself. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'll give you a certified ideation music um, and uh, write down the stuff you do and then get it onto that graph. You'll try to have at least seven or eight, if not ten things on there. If it's just four, that won't tell you much. Okay, so where we go from here is, um, stop. <clears throat> when there are 373 people in the room, we have to do that because it gets really crazy. Um, so um, we've got this laid out, now what? Well, what do you notice about your energy pass? So now that you've done this, just go, now we, you know, we've, we've done the empathy, what are you noticing? What's going on here? We're actually moving into the define step. You know, what's our point of view about what might be happening here? So I'm Bill. The first thing I notice is, you know, when Bill actually was an undergrad, um, he would have majored in art if he could have, if he had the gumption, uh, but he majored in product design, the closest thing he could. But he's always still long to be a true artist. He did some um, artwork and he finally said, I'm going to get back to that. So about two years ago, he started taking a figure drawing class. He takes figure drawing classes, I think it's Monday nights, far and away his favorite thing to do all week long. So it's totally positive energy. In fact, he even uh, attains a flow state. Um, who's heard of flow before? The, yeah, okay. So you're, you're in the zone, this one, you look up and suddenly, whoa, it's, you know, they're, they're, the, the model has put her clothes back on and left the room and he's all by himself, like, where'd everybody go? We just started, you know, because three hours went by. So he loves that. That's really a cool thing. Then he looked at this and he noticed the thing about, you know, the faculty meeting going either way and he has, you know, some authority over how the faculty meetings are run. So gee, maybe we could organize um, the agendas in such a way so that we make sure there are some interesting topics and we don't have those weeks where it's all the gritty, crummy, boring stuff, you know, just give ourselves a break, get the, the small business out of the way up front and then do the interesting conversations. We maybe could shift the shape of that a little bit. I can influence my world. So <clears throat> that might be interesting. Um, and well, what's going on there? The rest of the stuff kind of makes sense. You know, I, I, I like working out, I like teaching, you know, and then uh, what you master is coaching. Now that's, that's problematic because, you know, if I'm Bill, my favorite thing is talking to my students. You know, and, and I have you know, 150 undergrads and I get about 30 or 40 grad students, you know, that I'm advising. And that's like my favorite thing to do is coach these guys. And I notice I hate it. That's so weird. What's going on? You know, <clears throat> which then brings up what can you do about it? So now that I've made these observations, what possible changes could I make? Well, I could adjust the agenda here. You know, and I can just be sure I keep going to that. I do not of ever set up another meeting that conflicts with Monday night because I get this whole downstream wonderfulness effect. You know, if I miss one Monday night, I just hate it. So that's sacrosanct from now on. And the master's coaching, what's going on? Well, I don't not enjoy the conversation. I know what's going on. I'm in the wrong place. He was actually doing the master's coaching over where the uh, students all have their, uh, their shops. And it's too noisy and too, it's, it's kind of a fun, high energy place, but it's not a conversational place. So he just relocated it. He just moved it over to the patio on another part of the campus, you know, and it was a completely different feel, completely different ethos, the same amount of time, same students, same conversation, but the setting made it really work and the whole thing just flipped, boing, just like that. Now the reason we're doing this exercise is, you know, when we talk about designing your life, it feels like, well, do I really want to become, you know, a parachutist now? I mean, do I want to jump out of a plane instead of, you know, write code? That seems like a really big deal. The book's not about melodrama. You may not be wanting to redesign your life, but can you live the designed life? And so you can make small moves as well as big. And the same theories apply. So this is one thing we could all do and say, okay, what do I notice here? Are there any changes I could make within my current world without you know, getting a new degree or getting a whole new job, you know, to just adjust that the energy flows will actually work more for me than against me. And it comes in a whole variety of ways. Now, <laughs> at some risk I will mention, I was talking with a Google employee where we did some, uh, we did some pilots, um, and she had done this exercise and had a bunch of negative stuff that was really regular in a week, all week long, and she didn't know what to do, and she shared it with a colleague. Gosh, what do you think I should do? And the colleague says, just stop doing them. 
you know, these functions that you do. And she said, I don't think I can do that. She goes, are you sure? You could prototype, just don't do it. See what happens. So there were a bunch of functions that she did on a weekly basis, mostly had to do with going to other people's meetings and writing some reports. And she didn't write any of the reports and didn't go to any of the meetings. And nobody complained. So the report that she doesn't want to write, nobody reads. And the meetings that she goes to, they don't really care if she comes anyway, and she can read the minutes. So she just stopped, and there was zero effect. And after three weeks of zero effect, she mentioned to her boss, that's actually what I've been doing. Is it OK now? You know, I want forgiveness, not permission. Um, and, and got OK. And I think that's a fairly dramatic example. You know, like, oh, Dave said we could just stop doing the stuff we don't like. You know, that's great. Um, that is not the case. You know, but the, you know, there's low-hanging fruit here. This is the low-hanging fruit exercise. So take a couple of minutes now, and what do you notice about you? And what might you be able to do about it without getting out heavy equipment and make your life a little bit better? Okay. So what we're going to do now is um, you know, share with, have a conversation. Um, it turns out to be really hard to figure out exactly what you're doing um, or what your best ideas are if you don't have some degree of conversation. So we're going to, I want you guys to pair up. Um, and I'll tell you what you're going to do. And just, all you're going to do in just a minute, not this second, is you know, just show your map to your partner, you know, here's what I mapped, here's kind of what I noticed, and here's my idea or my question, what do you think? And just a brief conversation about your story, then flip, you know, and then a brief conversation about the other person's story, right? So I'll give you, you know, a couple of four minutes for person number one, you know, four or five minutes for person number two, about 10 minutes to have a conversation. Um, now, I noticed some people were either didn't have a page or were, and actually you were doing it on, uh, online on a sketch pad or just doing email. So if you opted out, if you actually didn't do the exercise at all, you're just listening today, you know, you're an adult, that's fine, that's your call. Um, but then just make yourself a third person and you're going to do listening twice. So you're going to listen and give feedback twice because you haven't got a story to tell. Don't wing it. You know, if you did the homework, great. If not, one of the things about our class, by the way, is it's not the class where you have to pretend you did the homework. You know, but you got to own you didn't do the homework because then, you know, the conversation slows down if you're just pretending you did the reading. So if you didn't do it, that's fine. Um, but just make yourself a third member of a conversation to give some people some feedback. So pair up right now. And you may there are odd numbered rows. And you don't have to know the per better if you don't know them, actually. So get a partner. Decide who goes first. Share your map. Give some feedback. Then change roles. <clears throat> I imagine you're not done. We're not trying to get done. We're trying to get started well enough. You'll finish later. Um, we don't have time to fully debrief that, but I mean, so in terms of the takeaways, I mean, so anybody get an idea? You could actually maybe give a try, and if it worked, that'd be kind of cool. Okay, so good. Yeah, 20, 30 um, percent. And so, you know, asking the question doesn't always generate that there's absolutely going to be an answer, but if we bring some attention and some intention to what we're doing with some reasonably accessible tools to keep the bar low, we can actually change things. So the takeaway on this energy thing is, you know, mapping your energy gives you a better sense of your engagement. Just being conscious, you know. How many would say actually, I mean, everything you wrote down you knew, but you didn't actually know that you knew until you wrote it down. And the realization, so just knowing in and of itself can actually change it. Oh yeah, here, yeah, this part's boring. Sure enough, it's boring again, you know, so you know, don't have to hate it. Don't, oh, God, it's boring. Yeah, just like, it's Tuesday, dude. I mean, which part do you not understand? It's, you know, uh, that always happens. Be prepared for it. Sequence is important. You know, pacing, we're all, you know, we're circadian animals. You know, when stuff happens matters. You have some control over that. And there is this correlation between energy engagement and meaning making. So, you know, um, the question of what is the meaning of life, that's for each of us to figure out on our own. But psychology is now studying a lot about the meaning in life. And being able to correlate, you know, you know, keep in mind, this is your body. You're, no, you're an embodied reality. This is not merely a transport mechanism for your brain. And so we actually experience this energy thing. And, you know, whether I'm an introvert or an extrovert, my personality is the nature of the work that works for me. These things are fairly complex. And by being smart about that and having an articulate recognition of how you engage with these things, your chance to get full acquisition and value out of those things and turn them into something meaningful um, it goes way up. You know, when Bill walks into his figure drawing class and goes, oh, man, I so love this, and here's why, and I remember why I did that. And he can articulate to himself why he's grateful for and fully engaged in the experience. It significantly amplifies it. So, <clears throat> so that brings us to now our particularly the number one big dysfunctional belief. I want to give you just a quick exercise, which is let's be sure that we are becoming our best selves. Are you being the best you? Are you sure this is it? Because you'll know whether or not this idea, which is very popular right now, um, is hitting you if you're asking questions like, are you sure this is it? Is this the one thing you should be doing? Are you really, or are you, are you not settling, are you? No one's settling here. That would be awful if you were settling. 
you know. Um, and the problem with this is it presuppose this question presupposes that there is one best, optimal, frankly, singularly exclusive version of you, and everything else is some degree of a compromise, um, which we think is actually profoundly false. There's an old business adage that says, good is the enemy of better, and better is the enemy of best. Are you doing your best? <laughs> or are you settling for better? But if there isn't a singular best, we're going to cover that in just a minute in some detail, but there's more than one of you in there, right? There's not just one of you in each of us. So if there's more than one of you, more good ones of you, you know, and you can't, and you can't always compare them on the same criteria. In fact, seldom can compare them on the same criteria, right? I mean, you know, was my mouse product manager a better me than my college educator me? They're entirely different things. Is beer better than ice cream? Do not ask me that question. <laughs> Um, somebody once said, you could combine them, you know. Um, I tried that, bad idea, the beer milkshake does not work. Okay, just want you to know right now. Um, but if there isn't a best, the rest of that adage becomes, the false best is the enemy of the available better. The false best is the enemy of the available better. And if you find yourself, or people, probably not you, but people you know um, who didn't come, um, who are beset by, I don't, I guess I'm not sure this is it, I think it might be settling, you know, and they really think there is this best, but there isn't one, once you've made that decision, you've decided to be unhappy the rest of your life. You don't deserve to ever think you're there because you're not there yet. Well, there, there isn't a there, there's a bunch of theirs. Which brings us to a pretty important question. So we have to reframe. There's lots of great use. It is never too late to get started. You know, a woman from the class of 50 came to the Manhattan meeting. She's 87 years old, and she sat in the front row. And she got stuck on the exercise. Well, you know, she's 87. You know. What do you want? Um, so I, I knelt down to, do you need some help? Well, I just have so many interests. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> You know, now, that's an aspirational way to be. You want to be constants when you grow up. Um, so we're all on this odyssey of life, this adventure. It never stops, right? We're just continuing to grow into our next version of our more like ourselves, whichever version of that we have in mind, which means you know, we really want to answer the question, how many lives are you? Um, would it help if I explain the question? So what I mean is, it's really clear there's more aliveness in each of us than one lifetime will permit us to render into reality, right? It's not all going to ship. Some of you is going to be unreleased. So if that's the case, right, then the question is, well, how much? Well, what if we imaginally said, it turns out it really is a multiverse. There are infinite parallel universes, like an angstrom apart if we just knew which axis to measure that on and could perceive it. You know, and that's true now. We actually know that's true. And concurrently, we also figured the wormhole thing out. So in terms we have, in modern day, we will have access to concurrent consciousness. So you can literally be as many of you as you want to be, and you can have access to all of them in parallel reality. And this is you know, parallel real time. It's not Wolverine where you just live forever and all your friends die over and over again. I mean, that's, you know, that's really a drag. Uh, you don't do the Wolverine thing, but you want to do parallel reality. Now, the other rule about the multiverse, it's a strange rule, but it uh, turns out we're not in charge, is you have to re reserve your slots. You can have as many slots to live a life and as many parallel multiverse universes as you would like, but you have to reserve them in advance. It's kind of like open table. So, I'm going to ask you the question, how many lives are you? How many slots in the multiverse would you like? Including, let's say, the one you're in now. I really like that. I'd do that over if I could. Sure, fine, you get two, you get three. Or like my daughter Lisa, first time at Disneyland, rode Dumbo 42 times <laughs> in a row. So she would have 42 lives with just a Dumbo ride. Um, that's cool if that's what you want. So right now, I want you to have a number in your mind how many lives you are. I'm going to go one, two, three, and when I would have said four, you say your number, and let's see what we get. Y'all get a number? Get a number. One, two, three. <laughs> Seven, three, three hundred. Okay. Um, I don't, that means, I don't, I didn't, usually there's a, an ideological loud one, and they're one. I have one life. I'm going to commit to it. You know. um, if that's you, that's fine. That's an ideological position. I get that. Uh, but I heard like 7, 10, 11. So first of all, this FOMO thing, fear of missing out, of course you're going to miss out. Most of you isn't going to happen. I lied. It's not true. You know, if you're 11, 10, you know, 88% of you ain't happening. Isn't that cool? <laughs> you're incredibly capacious people living in a target-rich environment with choices and possibilities. Of, and, you know, if anybody could see the world going by, you guys can. You're sitting in the crow's nest of the cosmos, you know, at Google, and stuff is happening. I mean, 
If you're paying any attention at all, 10 cool things you can't do go by daily. And you go, oh, no, God was that. Oh, shoot. You know, or do you go, up? Like, oh, there goes no one. Isn't it fabulous to live in this plentiful world where somebody as cool as I am can see this stuff? No. That's a reframe, by the way. OK, so when well, you've got lots of lives, then you know, if we're going to ideate our futures, you can't ideate your future. You can ideate your futures. And we normally, in the if we had time, we'd actually do this exercise, and we limit you to three. So we recommend doing the Odyssey plans. Your, it's not really plans, it's ideation, but three different ways you could live the next five years of your life. Three completely different ways you could be any one of the three of the many of you in the coming five years. <clears throat> Which looks like we actually have a one-page worksheet, you know, and in 10 or 15 minutes, if we had them, which we don't, we'd fill this thing out, and you put a timeline down that actually shows, you know, professional, personal things. I'll give you an example in just a second. Um, and then when you look at the, the life that that description characterizes you, what's the narrative of that? What's the story? Because they're not just three plans. They're three lives, and each life is a narrative. It's a story. So what does that story mean to me, and how, how do I feel about it? We have a dashboard. What's the dashboard? What do the dials on your dashboard tell you about this version of life that you could lead? And the four da dashboard dials are resources, 0 to 100%. Do I have what it takes? Do I have the training? Do I have the time? Do I have the money, the, you know, the relationships to pull this thing off? Do I like it? Am I hot or cold on this thing? How do I actually feel about this? Am I confident it will happen? If I, what's my confidence I can pull this off? I mean, even if my resources are low or high, my confidence might be different. Those are not always linked. Um, and then coherence, probably the hardest one to explain, uh, we simply mean by that authenticity or fit. Is this plan, is this version of me, if I look at this life I just drew and wrote down, is that one of the real me's? Is it coherent to who I am? Does it reflect my values? Does it reflect my personality? Can I actually see myself doing that? Or is this one, yeah, it's coherent to mom. It's coherent to mom, but it is not so coherent. Or maybe my advisor. My advisor is still saying, why didn't you go tenure track? You know, oh, you know, so somebody's got this plan. Maybe it's not mine. Then it's not a coherent plan. Let me give you an example really quickly. What would this sound like if we did it? This is Debbie. This is a real person. 48 year old, Debbie's 48. Um, you know, she's been in, in high tech actually and in operating roles, a very effective executive, and she's thinking about, do I want to go back and pick up that idea I had long ago about working with at-risk kids? Uh, and she's thinking maybe she's going to do that. So this is using what I know to help kids. So I'm really good at running things. Let me go run something else, you know, kind of a classic idea for some, you know, <clears throat> middle-aged people. And so I'm going to start a 501c3. I'm an operatingly-minded person. Minded person. I'm going to do the, the operational thing first. I'm going to raise some money, and I'm going to pick the reading model we're going to invest in. We have to have a theory of change. You know, there's a lot of people out there who know a lot about how to help at-risk kids do reading. That's the thing she focused on. Early reading programs have a huge leverage downstream for kids, it turns out. So let's focus on that. Got that thing figured out. And then i got to scale this thing. So this isn't the cute little thing I'm doing on the side. You know, this is, I'm, I'm really refocusing my career. I want to go big here. You know, so I'm going to start on the West Coast, and then go to the East Coast, because that's where a lot of the analytics are. And if you want to impress people in the academy, which is where you get credibility, it's on the East Coast. You know, and then eventually, I need to have a bunch of kids going through this thing and scale it up. So in five years, I should be, I should be at the visible scale level of activity. And boy, once I hit that, I mean, it's going to get way the heck busy. And now that I think about it, before I get too completely distracted, I need to remember my family. I got a family to care about. You know, I'm 48. My siblings are in their 50s. And mom and dad are still living, but they're really beginning to age. I mean, they're not young at all. We had a family meeting. And mom and dad said, no, we, when we need help, we don't want it from you, with all due respect. And we love you guys, but we don't want to live with you. Um, so we got to find a place for mom and dad to go. And, you know, we've been saying in the family for years now that we got to get the family story, and we don't. And there's a bit of history of dementia. We're not, we have no idea how far we are from mom and dad can't tell the story anymore. So before too much time goes by, we've got to find a place for them. We've got to get that story written down. And now that I think about it, you know, um, I'm not sure I know what I'm doing. I mean, I cared about this 20 years ago. I'm really good at business, but, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. And these at-risk kids are troubled. Maybe I should pick up that MA in counseling. And if so, I've got to do that right away. I've got to do that early on. I can do, there's a night program near me. I could do it in two years' time. I get that done. You know, and that's really interesting. And then, boy, that scale thing kicks off. So anything that's going to happen has got to happen before. So that's when I've got to make sure once we pick where mom and dad go, it's time to get back to Paris. We promised ourselves we'd get to Paris one more time before we got too busy. So we've got to get that in. And let's swing through the Galapagos on the way home. That was on my bucket list. I want to get that done. 
So you know, if I do all that, boy, that's pretty cool. I should uh, I should write a book. I should, you know, that's uh, I'm writing a book about what that life change was about. That's really interesting. So that's an interesting life. And how do I feel about that? Well, you know, I got about half the resources. I don't have the money yet. I don't have the team yet. I mean, there's a lot to do. But I know how to do stuff. Um, I really like it, and my confidence is actually pretty high. Because even though the things that are missing, I, I can see how to do them. Now, coherency-wise, I'm actually a little worried there. I mean, it sounds all that noble stuff, but I think I'm mostly speaking out of my 25-year-old self, and I'm 48. So it may all still be true, but I've got to go test that. I've got to go test that a little bit. So that's my story. That is, you know, in a couple of minutes, what one Odyssey plan five year would look like. And then you do two more. You do two very different looking ones in order to have more than one idea. Now, it's not that you're going to implement all these plans, but the whole idea is, and the research has shown, particularly in the School of Ed, if you brainstorm off of multiple plans, you will, on all of them, have wider ranging ideas and better ideas. You have one core plan and try to brainstorm out from it. Your domain of ideation will be narrower and your outcomes will be smaller. You will fall prey to your own internal judgment. Now, once you get your plans figured out, you know, because it's just the one hour gig here, we haven't got time to actually do that, but you could do that on your own if you wanted to. It's all in the book. Um, <clears throat> it's time to do prototyping. I mean, just having an idea is fine, but now we've got to go do something. Bias to action time, and so we want to do prototyping. Why? Design prototypes ask interesting questions. Expose assumptions, which you can't plan. You just go do them and go, oh, I didn't realize I was thinking that. And then you involve other people with your ideas. They're inherently collaborative. Prototypes become the substrate upon which you can collaborate into your future. It's a way to work with other people. And it's really sneaking up on the future. A good prototype is cheap, fast, easy to implement, and actually teaches you something. The key distinction between an engineering prototype that, like a beta test, that proves the thing works according to your expectation, according to spec, that's a test prototype, usually done in engineering. These are design prototypes, which are quick mock-ups, quick experiences, because I know that I don't really understand this yet. I need to go out into the world and try it. It's experiential learning, which is why you can't fail. You have failure immunity when you're doing design prototyping. There are two kinds in life design. How do you prototype a life? Wait a minute, it's not like a mouse. I had a box full of you know, foam rubber mice once upon a time, a um, hundred of them. Um, you know, that, this is not the same, it's not as easy. Uh, it's really simple, two things, conversations and experiences. Uh, and by conversations, we simply mean go visit your future. The thing you're thinking about, the thing you're curious about, somebody's already doing that, understands that, knows that. There are people in the world that are probably already intersecting the thing that you're thinking about. So let's find them and have a conversation. Hey, what's it like over there, person currently living in my future? You're not asking for the job. You're not asking to be admitted. You're not asking for money. You're asking them to, tell, to give you something that most people really like to give away, their story, right? What's your name? Lauren. Lauren. So it turns out, so Lauren, and, and what do you do here? I'm a software engineer. I'm a software engineer. I don't, I, no, I'm just so interested in software. I don't know anything about so I know a little bit. I can't code for, do you, do you write code? Can you code? OK. <laughs> and so I would really like, it turns out, you know, I'm interested in software, and so are you. And I'm interested in what you do, and so are you. So we have a common interest. We both think you are so interesting. <laughs> so we should like form a little club. I'll buy the coffee. We'll hang out. Yeah, she's getting scared now. The, uh, so, <laughs> why did I sit in the front row? <laughs> um, you know, but that's really what's going on. I mean, everybody finds themselves and what they're doing pretty interesting. And that's all you're asking people for is get the story. Don't ask for the job, ask for the story. That's the conversation. And then the prototype experience, go try doing something. Now, how does that actually work? So you look at your plan and kind of go, what am I worried about or curious about? So what on that, one on that thing is giving me some anxiety I really want to manage a little bit? Or, gee, that's interesting, I'd like to know more. So I'm staring at that, I'm Debbie, I'm kind of going, well, that's interesting. You know, what comes to my attention is this book thing. Writing, I've never written a book, I just actually went through writing a book, and boy, did I not know what I was getting into. Um, by the way, it's really hard. Uh, um, so uh, how could I do that? Well, there are lots of people I could talk to. I could go find people, you know, not that hard to find somebody who's been an author or knows an author, who's been in the publishing industry, was an agent, had something to do with the book business, you know, and just get a cup of coffee and get your story. And if I do that three, four, five, six times, um, I will know so much more and I can borrow your experience, not just a research conversation, you know, what's the royalty rate and how, long do, how, many, how many words a day do you write? I mean, that's just factualisms, which are fine, but what's the experience like? How did you get there? What did you have in mind? What was the surprise? Tell me the story and then I can vicariously start picking that stuff up and it's pretty cheap. Conversations come pretty fast and cheap. And now that I think about it, you know, that going back to school, 
I'm 48, they're gonna look at me funny, you know, you're not one of us, you know, I'm not sure I really wanna do that. So he said, look, you, could only, you, can't, you can't just think about that, you gotta go try it. So Debbie, you gotta go sit in class, or get you to audit classes, and go out there, and she did, and she goes, guess what, it turns out, I really loved it. I mean, my whole body was just sort of like tingling. I just, I, I forgot how much I loved to learn in that context. And, and yeah, the students were all 20 years my junior, and they thought it was cool I came to class. It turns out millennials are kind of nice. I heard they were mean, it's not true, you know. Um, and so I'm really having a good time. That's an experience, you know, and it wasn't that hard to get. So you're learning how to generate experiences and conversations that are readily accessible and maybe don't solve the problem entirely, but really advance your awareness, your understanding, and your experiential encounter. She had to feel what it was like being back in the classroom, not just read about it. So, to do that, of course, you know, all these things come through people, which means you gotta make the connection. So, of course, that's networking. This is probably like, oh, finally you got to the networking part, right? Who loves networking? How many networking fans? We got? Yeah, exactly both of them, okay. Um, so most of us, maybe I kind of agree with her, like, I don't know, it's not so cool. You know, who, who thinks that networking is a little on the sleazy side? Little, not my style. Okay, reframe. Um, no, it's just asking directions. You know, I don't know my way around Codingville. Lauren does. You know, you maybe don't know your way around nanotechnology town or, you know, nonprofit, the nonprofit sector. You know, you're lost in town. Anybody ever give directions to a lost person? Um, and after it was over, how'd you feel? Awesome. Felt awesome? Good. Good? Stranger walks up, <laughs> rips off your competency, and just leaves, and you feel good. <laughs> Dude, you got used, and you felt good. Studies now show people like helping people. Turns out human beings like being human beings. So um, people are willing to help you, particularly when the bar, it's not you're asking them to manipulate somebody or give you a job you don't deserve. Like, would you mind if I let somebody feel terrific about themselves by talking about their life while I pay for the coffee? Is that okay with you? That's really not a high ask. So, by the way, you know, this is a great time. If there's something you would like to know more about in the world, I, prom I literally promise you, somebody in this room knows somebody that would be really interesting for you to talk to. But the only way you get that is to ask them. So um, don't be shy about saying, hey, do you know anybody who could tell me more about, like, so what is going on at the Google Foundation? Hey, what's up with that autonomous car thing? Whatever it might be. So, so it's different, we're wrapping up, we're done. You know, the three things that are now true about this process that weren't true before is, you know, you, you guys are not the guinea pigs on, on the book. You know, we're a couple of thousand people into this process over almost a 15-year period. Two PhD dissertations were done evaluating the rigor of the efficacy of the intervention of our model, as, which sounds like proctology or something. You know, it sounds like invasive surgery, but it's a couple of um, educational psychologists evaluating whether or not this thing works. And the good news is it does. Um, according to the scientists, and it's the first time at Stanford where we invented design thinking or human-centered design, we actually applied it to this problem. So those, those three things come together for the first time in this process in a way that we hope will help you. That's the whole point, you know? And why it works is because you're people. And the human-centered design process we developed, which is built around both how people have ideas and then how people would use the solutions built from those ideas, hopefully fit real people like you in the real world. That's the whole point. So, Thanks for your time. Good luck designing your life. Enjoy the ride. You can do this. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>